Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. Welcome to today's episode, My German-American Family. Today, we'll be speaking with math and engineering high school teacher, Pete Schornstedt. Pete's parents, Hans and Ingrid, emigrated to the United States from Germany in the 1950s as young single adults. Later, they met and married and raised a family in New Jersey. Pete will tell how his parents, as children, experienced the effects of World War II in Germany and the devastation left in its wake. He will then tell about their journey to the United States, along with the challenges and opportunities they experienced in their new homeland. He will also share about his life growing up in a German-American home, including the traditions, food, personalities, and other family memories. I'd now like to welcome Pete to our show. Welcome, Pete. Nice to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. I want to start off by asking you, Pete, a little bit about yourself. Where were you born and raised, and what do you do for a living? Well, first of all, I'm a a teacher. I teach at a high school. I've been teaching there for 25 years. I can't believe it's been that long. You know, you you get to an institution, and you never think that you're going to be one of those people that... (laughs) You know, when people come in, they associate you with the school because you've been there so long. Yeah. And God bless you teachers, by the way, for what you're doing during this COVID situation. I know you've got to be very flexible. Yeah. I mean, it's a tough thing for the kids. You know, I have to tell you, we've actually come a long way in a very short period of time. We've done a lot of good stuff. We have a lot to learn still. We have a long way to go. It's been a long road, but there has been a lot of progress, which is great. Thank you for that. It is all new territory for so many people, the parents, the kids, the teachers. Thank you again for what you do teaching our kids. Yep, absolutely. So you were asking me, you know, where I came from and stuff. I was born in Hackensack Hospital, 1967. (laughs) Yay, Hackensack, good old Hackensack, New Jersey. Hackensack Hospital, yeah. So I was a Bergen County kid by the time when I was, I think, two, maybe three we moved to Pramus, and that's where I spent most of my life up until college. Went to Rutgers University, have an engineering degree, civil engineering, which I'm actually using a little bit now. You know, it's funny because I'm teaching engineering, but it, it's so I, I always kid myself. I'm the only one with an engineering degree, but I was the least prepared to teach engineering <laughs> when I got into it. Then I got married eight years ago, so I moved now to Essex County. So I went from Bergen to Sussex to Essex. So let's... Look back at your family, where they came from and who they were. Well, you know, it's funny because I just had a friend call me the other day. He was a high school friend and I hadn't talked to him in a long time. And I was kind of thinking about when I was in high school, how I used to go over people's houses. You know, when you're a kid, you don't really put a stamp on things necessarily like you do when you're an adult. You know, like when you're an adult, you, you make comparisons and that's it. When you're a kid, you're just She's kind of like moving along. You're going with the flow is really what you're doing. And I remember in high school, really kind of pinpointing, I grew up a little differently than everybody else. My parents come from Germany. My mother's from Hamburg and my father is from Leba, which is now part of Poland. But at the time it it was considered Germany, which is on the uh, Baltic Sea, actually. So my mother is a city girl and my father is a shore guy. Growing up with German parents is a very unique experience that you don't really get to appreciate until you're older. You only know of certain traditions when you're a kid because you you don't really, again, you're just going with the flow. You don't really understand, but you're just, you know, you're just living your life. Growing up with them was very different. There was a certain set of rules that didn't really apply when I went over my friend's house. You didn't have to take your shoes off and put your slippers on, your house slippers. And you didn't have to put your shoes in the correct spot. (laughs) You know, I go in my friend's house and he's walking in, he's throwing his book bag all over the place and stuff. I would be crucified if I did that. You know, it's like (laughs) the reason for that is both my parents lived through World War II as very young children. My father passed away three years ago and my mother had two unique experiences during the war as children. My father was born in 1937. And my mom was born in 1939. So we're talking right at the cusp of when World War II began. They lived through some really 
tough time. You know, Germany was absolutely devastated during the war, and they were just kids not really understanding what was going on around them. You know, the one thing that I did notice growing up with my parents is that anything that you owned or had was very precious. I'll give you a quick example of it. Two things. So I remember, (laughs) so if you were to go into my house and go into a closet, say where the sheets are, or if you went into my drawer where like my uh, t-shirts were, everything was ironed. My mother ironed our bed sheets. She ironed our summer curtains because, you know, you had to switch your curtains from summer to winter. There was winter curtains and there were summer curtains. Of course. Because in the winter, your windows are very drafty and you had a very heavier set of curtains. So if you went into the closet, that closet was very organized. You know, I go back to that when I went into my friend's house, he would throw his book bag all over the place. You know, there was just stuff everywhere. That was every one of my friend's house. Not that all the houses were sloppy and stuff like that, but not organized. And when you live with two German parents, everything that you have and everything that you that you own is precious and must be organized and <laughs> at its right spot. <laughs> now, it, I, I'm try, you know, painting my parents in this light, but it was a very loving household. They taught me to appreciate that you know everything that you owned is precious. You didn't waste anything. And the other story I could have for you is I always knew that when you're a young child, you don't really know what the change of seasons are, but I did because in the winter we had these down feather beds. Now, I don't know if you know what a down feather bed I is. Do. But it, so everything was down. They spent their money on very few things, but the things that they spent their money on were very precious to them and expensive. And these down comforters, there was no slip sheet, no nothing. It was the down comforter, and you could tell because it was nice and thick. Then you had that special down pillow. So that was the winter. And then you knew it was springtime because those went away one day magically. You know, mom is cleaning, you know, your feather bed. And you run into your bedroom that, by the way, you shared with your brother. Mm-hmm. And the beds have this like very thin sheet on them. And, oh, it's the summer sheets. We must be heading into spring. You know, <laughs> it was that kind of deal. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you think this is because of the experiences that they had during the war years as far as being very appreciative of the little they had? Or was it more of a German cultural thing, do you think? It's a a great question because I think it's a combination of both. The German culture, I can't speak for it now, but I think back then the Germans, they took pride in what they had and what they owned. I think that was instilled in part of it because during the war, my mother and father didn't have very much, but what they had, they kept very dear. I think it's a combination of stuff. We can get into how my mom and dad grew up, but they really did live with very few things. And the thing about that is, too, is you would never know it because they never talked about it. They, they never complained about the stuff that they never had. Like, I've never had a conversation or heard my mother have a conversation of like, oh, we didn't have that when we were kids. They, they would never say that. There was a certain pride that they took with them with the hardships that they had. Yeah. You know, and I, you don't really get that sense until you are an adult and you start having your own you know, paying your own mortgage and having your own stuff that you start realizing, I have it much better than they ever had it. They were great parents, I have to say. You know, my mom is still alive. She lives in Florida. I said my dad passed three years ago. My mom lives very simply. She really does. The last time I visited her when I went down there, she has a checklist for me when I go down. I don't know how many people have this type of checklist, but this might give you an idea of stuff. You know, we have to take the oven and we have to pull the oven off the wall because there might be some dust behind the oven. <laughs> so <laughs> she didn't believe in out of sight, out of mind then, I guess. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so half my vacation, so if I'm spending two weeks or 10 days, whatever it is with my mom, 10 of, you know, half of that time, I'm replacing uh, filters and uh, <laughs> I'm cleaning behind the refrigerator. Everything has its place. I remember uh, she asked me once to get something out of the junk drawer. So I opened the drawer and it's not a junk drawer. That thing is so organized. You have no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Did your mom or dad ever have discussions with you or did you ever ask them about what it was like as children during World War II in Germany? The last real discussion I had with my mom, I mean, it brings her to tears. Not because she's upset about herself, it's because what it did to her family. It's it's a different type of uh, remembering that that she doesn't want to go through. So 
they will never talk about it. They never talked about it. We never sat around the dinner table and be like, well, we're going to talk about our childhood now. You really kind of had to drum it out of them. So just a, I'll do a quick thing about my mom. My mom was, let's see, she was born in 39. So she was about, when the war broke out, when, when, they, when they did Operation Barbarossa, I guess, when they invaded Russia, that was 41, right? So that's two, so she's two years old. By the time the conflict had elevated, she was probably six-ish, right? In 45, she was probably six. Her remembrances of those years, and one distinct thing that she told me was that she remembers her mother explaining to her that when the lights go out, this is where your coat is. If we get separated, this is where we're going to meet. And it was a bomb shelter. So her mom would take her to the bomb shelter prior to that whole conflict and show her exactly where they would meet and exactly, you know, if they ever got separated and stuff like that. One story that she told me was that her mom turned to her during a, you know, because Hamburg was one of the most bombed cities in Germany at the time. And the one thing that brought her to tears was her mom turned to her and said, happy birthday. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, you shelter. really, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and my mom is a very strong woman. I mean, she has been through a lot. She's been through my father's death and stuff, but you know, that kind of stuff brings her to tears. Again, it's not for her, it's for her mom, you know, and for her family. So. Those were some tough times. And now her dad, who I don't know much about in terms of the war, he fought in the Wehrmacht. I don't have much information on him in terms because he survived the war. And my grand. So here's another thing. If you (laughs) you want to flip this again for the differences between my family and, and my friends, my friends had their grandparents that lived around the corner or they lived in another state, you know, and they visited them maybe once a month or once a week, whatever it is. My grandparents were in Germany, so they would come in the summertime and they would visit for like two months. We had a house probably just as small as my house here, one bathroom. My parents would give them their bedroom. They would move upstairs, which was an unfinished upstairs. They would live with us for two months. And two months in the house, we would speak German because they didn't know any English. But my grandfather never talked about the war, was a very happy guy. I have great memories of him. One thing my mom did say was that the war severely affected him because he didn't want to go. He was more or less forced to go into the war. I don't know much else about him in terms of the war. So you flash that over to my father's side. So my father grew up in Leyba and he was one of six kids. And his oldest brother, who I think was born in 1920, if I'm not mistaken, he was at that ripe age to be drafted into the, uh, the Wehrmacht. I have a cousin and he was doing a little research for me and he's not sure because my uncle's wife, my aunt, is still alive. She's 92 today. Actually, today is her 92nd birthday. Wow. She was talking to him a little bit about it and she thinks he was in the 106th Army, which was the army that was heading to Stalingrad. So he was in the initial push to Stalingrad in Operation Barbarossa. That was no picnic. On either side. Well, it it was in the beginning, right? Because I think Barbarossa started in June. So the Germans were having a lot of success, but they were covering a lot of ground. You're absolutely right. I mean, I can just imagine the things that he uh, that he went through, but he actually went through Ukraine and he was on the way to Stalingrad and a grenade landed in his foxhole. Now, he was actually a, a star in soccer. He had some quick reactions. So he threw the grenade out, but it exploded in midair. And he was wounded very badly. Uh, I remember him as a kid. He had trap metal in his ear and they couldn't they wouldn't get it out. So he had that still, you know, as an older person because he did survive the war on his way to Stalingrad. He got so he got injured and his lungs were severely punctured. So he was actually in a triage tent for six months in Ukraine. They wouldn't move him. So here was a guy, he was 19, 20, 21. He was sitting in a, you know, in a tent for six months recovering from this, this injury, which he actually really never really recovered from. They couldn't get the shrap metal completely out. It was a mess. It was a real bad situation. So he survived the war, though. He did survive the war. And as a matter of fact, what had happened was is they patched him up and they sent him back to Germany after the six months. And they stuck him on a train. And they wouldn't tell them where he was going. And he ended up going down into Italy. And he was supposed to fight in Italy. But since he was incapacitated, he was sent down to Italy for some type of, I I don't know what the conflict was, but he ended up falling off of a cliff. Oh no! Right. And he was unconscious for a very long period of time. And 
an Australian soldier found him, and so he had to surrender. So he ended up going to Libya into a camp the English were running. And there in Libya, he ended up driving a supply truck for the British because the camp down in Libya, they were going nowhere at that point. It was towards the end of the war at this point. He was allowed to drive a truck. Now, the funny thing about that is he didn't know how to drive a truck. And the British wanted someone to drive the supply truck to buy supplies because the supplies, to get him into the camp and stuff like that, that, you know, there was some stuff that needed to be done. So he volunteered for it. The only thing he knew how to do was drive a motorcycle. They only owned motorcycles. So um, he learns how to drive this truck, and he ends up doing that until the end of the war. I will tie this back into my dad. Sure, um, sure. This is great, Peter. I'm glad that you have some of these stories that you can recount for us. Well, it's kudos to my cousin. You know, when you're a kid and you hear a lot of these different stories, you get a lot of different things, and you kind of try to tie them together, and you think you know what the stories are. Actually, a lot of this stuff I had heard, so I'm, I'm actually glad that he talked to my aunt because obviously my uncle had talked to my aunt about these things because he wouldn't talk to anyone else about it. No one really in the family, maybe his sister, but uh, no one really in the family never really talked openly about this kind of stuff. That's the thing about my grandfather, my mother's side. This is not stuff that they want to relive or wanted to recount. So it's not something that, and as a kid, you didn't really think about asking it anyway. It's just the, how they, they handled their stress. Yeah. My uncle at the end of the war, so the war is over, 1945, but he's still stuck in Libya. So they send him back to Germany, and he works in a coal mine of all places. So he volunteers to work, and there's a guy with injured lungs. He's got strap metal in his ear, and he volunteers to work in a coal mine knowing that they have to give him an exam. And once they gave him an exam, they realized that they couldn't use him anymore. So then he was free to leave. He ends up leaving and he goes back to Leyba and he realizes that in Leyba, they're all gone. They've been relocated. So that's the common theme about this whole thing. You know, when Germany was destroyed, you didn't go back to your hometown because it probably wasn't there anyway. You were relocated somewhere. And that happened to both my mom and my dad. So my dad, his entire family was relocated down into Dusseldorf, which is southern Germany. So Leyba is northern part of Poland um, now. It was uh, the northern part of Germany then, and now he has to go all the way down to Dusseldorf. So he goes from being a shore guy to, uh, you know, Dusseldorf city guy. They had these makeshift barracks, which had no running water. It was a very primitive upbringing. So my uncle goes back, and the first person he saw was my dad. And my dad at the time was probably, at that point, it was probably 1946, 1947. So my dad was nine or 10 at that time. And, and my uncle, that was the first person that he saw. Really? So I thought that was, yeah, I thought that was an interesting part of the story. Yeah, his, you know? his big brother he sees, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Because your uncle would have been about 25 or 6. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So my father, again, he's at that age where you're at that age of innocence. You don't really know. You know, everything is a new adventure. You may not understand it. You know, people are going through hardships, but it's not the same thing. You know, you're just a kid. So he's just happy to see his older brother. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And they had a real hard time there. They ended up getting relocated to another city after that. But I could just imagine what that whole thing was about. When the Russians came in, you know, the Germans weren't very good to the Russians when they were going across during their campaign. And the Russians were equally not as good to the Germans on the way back, understandably. They did survive it. Even my father's father, my grandfather on his side. Now, he was too old to fight in the war. He was probably in his mid to later 40s at that point. But he was in charge of air raids and stuff like that. So every person had their role. I never knew my grandfather on my dad's side because he had passed away. He actually fought in World War I. He helped out in World War II. And he ended up dying coming home from a bar on his bicycle. Oh. So, yeah. Again, that's, that's a generation that we just, we will never understand. We have no reference to that generation because... The hardships that they had and the, and the little bit that they had to fight for, I mean, that's who they were. And that's not something that you can ever understand. You can read about it, you can hear about it, but it's something that you'll never understand. You know, Pete, this is a very interesting conversation to be having with you because my mother lived in London during World War II. She was in the Royal Air Force. She joined the Royal Air Force when she was 18, but... Just prior to that was the Blitz on London. 
I think, 57 straight nights of bombing. So That's my right. mother was no stranger to the air raid shelters. Her mother, who was actually a World War I vet, as my grandfather was, my grandfather was in both the First and Second World War. My grandmother, like your grandfather in Germany, was a warden. She was a fire warden. She was actually conscripted as a civilian to patrol in London after bombings and search for fires and call them in. It is so interesting to me to be able to speak with you, knowing now that your parents were just children and they were experiencing this. They had nothing to, to do about it. They didn't know what was going on, really. They just had these early memories of a lot of really devastation and hard times. Yeah, it's almost like two sides of the same coin, right? You, yeah. you, know, you think about your mom and my mom and my mom's in Hamburg, you know, your mom's in London, two of the most heavily devastated cities of the war. Yeah. It's just an amazing, to read about it in a history book is one thing. Okay. You know, London was destroyed, you know, during the war. Okay. But to live through something like that, no one will ever know or, or have a reference to that. But uh, I think you're right. These stories are important. It's a shame my mom doesn't like to open up and share them, but you can also have an appreciation for that as well. You can have a total understanding of not wanting to live through that experience because everything in her life has been so, so dearing up into that. You know, she, she raised two kids, you know, I have an older brother, she had a loving husband. She has a nice life. You know, they bought a house, you know, they have a lot of stuff to be thankful for. And that's the thing that my parents have really kind of instilled upon me without actually saying it. They just, they lived it. So you lived it. It was kind of that type of mentality. I really honor that a lot. Definitely. Pete, I want to ask you then, so we're at the end of World War II and things are not good in Germany and your parents both ended up coming to the United States. How did that come about? They did. They did indeed. So that's a good story. I'll talk about my mother's side first. My mother and her family had to relocate from Hamburg because when they went back, there was no place to go. Everything was in ruins. So they were also relocated to South Germany. Now, I'm not exactly sure where in South Germany. You know, she was also relocated and it was decided that she was going to live with her principal and their wife because they had a place for her. They had no running water at the time. They only had an outhouse. And this is the way my mom spent her teens up until she was out of high school. I have some kids who complain that their phone died today, you know, uh, so, uh, <laughs> no comparison, so, but my mom still, she was very thankful. So she had an opportunity. My one uncle, her mother's brother, they had already relocated to the house that I lived in as a kid. They were already living in Paramus and they invited her over to go sightseeing, to tour America and see what America is all about. So my mom decided after high school, which I believe is called gymnasium in German, she decided to come over for an extended period of time. I think it started out she was going to be here for two months. They traveled across the country. She came back. She lived with them for a little while. And they said, well, look, while you're here, maybe you should get a job. I do know that she landed a job as an operator for Bell Telephone, which was in the city. So she's on this work visa. She works at Bell Telephone. She decides that she wants to stay. So she applies for her citizenship, learns the language, takes the tests, and becomes a U.S. citizen. She ended up living in the Bronx. On my father's side, so I said he had six siblings. The oldest sibling was my uncle, and the next sibling was my aunt. And my aunt had an opportunity to come over to America to marry a German who had just recently lost his wife. So she comes over first. The marriage was arranged in some way. She comes over and then one by one, she gets the rest of the family over because in the meantime, I told you my grandfather was killed uh, riding a bike from uh, yeah. back from a bar. Mm -hmm. Well, my grandmother had a heart attack uh, very soon after that. It was just the siblings at that point. They all came over on a boat one by one. My father... And his brother, my other uncle, they finished trade school. So they were the last two to come over. And they also relocated on Crosby Avenue in the Bronx. Wow. Yeah. 
it's kind of like the Italian families. The Italian families were always, you know, you had your generations that all lived in one spot. It, it was a little bit like that. They, they only had each other. They didn't have anybody else. They were a very close-knit, tight family. I have some pictures of my father ice skating as a young kid, this young 14-something-year-old kid. My father looked a lot like Elvis back in the day. I guess that was the look everybody was looking for. But he looked very happy. And he talked about those years as being very endearing. He loved those years. He worked in a foundry. So he went to trade school in Germany for foundry work. So basically what they did is they made sand cast molds for engines and stuff like that. And what had happened was is his allergies were so bad in the foundry because the foundry work was very tough and it was very hot, dusty and all that kind of stuff. He couldn't do it anymore. And he ended up becoming a butcher. He was very good. Yeah, he worked in uh, German delis. And then he ended up working for ShopRite. Later on, not Costco, uh, what's the other, BJ's Wholesale. That's where he ended up. He definitely dug out a life for himself. And how did your parents meet? He has a brother that's two years older than him. And he had a wife that also worked in Bell Telephone sitting next to my mother as an operator. So they talk a lot and they're like, you know, I have this, this guy you might want to meet. So they ended up meeting in a restaurant in the Bronx. My father used to talk about the candy store, but a candy store back in the 50s meant there was a bar in the back. So, you know, a, a 50, a 50, circa 50s candy store was actually just the place. It was like a gin mill with candy in the front for the kids. So they were just, <laughs> so I remember stories of him taking my mother there a lot. My father definitely liked his beer. As am I, by the way, I have to be honest with you. You're connoisseurs. Yeah, <laughs> connoisseur. That's right. So that's how they met. They went out. And before you know it, they were, you know, were going steady. I think that was around 19, I want to say that was like 1955, 56, maybe. Pete, as far as your mom and dad both coming to the United States, I assume they didn't speak English? Yeah, that's exactly right. My mother has a heavy, heavy German accent. You know my mother's German when you talk to her, okay? My father sounds like he's from the Bronx, all right? My father had this, like, he was all in. My father was actually very good with languages. He liked to speak Spanish or try Spanish. I think that was a, a result of his work environment. But he also, he had a genuine interest in languages. Yeah, again, you know, you go back to that German pride thing. They wanted to be American. They wanted to be considered Americans. They wanted to adopt American life. They knew this was going to be their place and this was their home. And my mom talks about, we really made it a point to learn English properly. My mom is very, very bright person. I never realized how bright my mother was until years later when I was out of college. And when you're a kid, it's just your mom. She's the one who makes the beds and stuff. But, you know, my mom, you know, she got herself a job when I was in middle school and she worked for BMW and, and she was a very, still is a very bright individual. Um, but she made it a point and my father made it a point that they are going to speak English and this is what they're going to do. That's exactly what they did. And they took a lot of pride in that. When we were young at the dinner table, my father would start saying something in English. And he would finish it in German. <laughs> if you were getting yelled at, you were getting yelled at in German because you knew you were in trouble. Or they would start off something in German. Or if they couldn't remember a word, they would say it in German. So again, that's another part of your upbringing that you don't really appreciate until after you're out. You know, my friends are all speaking English all the time. Not my house, you know. <laughs> it's funny you should say that, Pete, because when I grew up around, my mom had a very strong British accent, a London accent. Love and it. my paternal grandparents came over and my aunt from England, and they had strong English accents. So I spent a lot of time around them. So when I went into kindergarten, <laughs> I mean, I'm born and raised in New Jersey. I walked in. And I'm saying words like tomato and mosquito and garage. And of course I got boot of the car. The oh, boot of the, car. the boot. And I got persecuted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a better one for you. Yeah. <laughs> so my brother is six years older than me. And my brother was born in New York in the Bronx. So he lived on Crosby Avenue. But, you know, in the early days, my parents wanted to make sure that the kids were brought up German or just knew of the German culture. They almost spoke too much German. When it came time for my brother to go to kindergarten, he didn't know that much English. He spoke mostly German. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was hilarious. My aunt is still in Germany and my uncle is still in Germany. And 
when we visit my mother, she makes it a point of us calling them. And it's like torture for me because I can understand German very well. It's when you have to speak it, the words don't come to you very well. But my brother is very good. He can really hold a conversation still, which I applaud him for because he, he's very good with that. It's a very interesting thing when you're going through it. You don't really think much of it until you have a conversation with a person like yourself that you realize how different things were when you were a kid. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, Pete, when your mom and dad came over, so you figure it's the mid fifties, World War II has only been finished for 10 years. Yeah. Recent memory. A lot of people still walking around who were affected by the war. Did they ever receive any negative feelings or actions from other people because of their German heritage? I'm not really too sure about that, I have to be honest with you. If they did, they never talked about it. My father, I think because they were laborers, because my father was a butcher, his oldest brother, the one who was injured in the war, you know, he worked in a paper factory cutting paper for newspapers and books. I think it was called Arrow, Arrow Paper. I think because they were laborers and they were so ingrained in the culture that I don't think they really paid attention to that. And I'm sure there was a lot of animosity, especially with people who came back from the war. That wasn't my parents' war. My mom being six and my father, that's not their war. You know, that's someone else's war. So I, I, that type of reference. And I know there's a lot of stigma, well, you're German and, and all that, but First of all, I don't think you would even know if you talked to my dad that he was German anyway. You would think he's been in Brooklyn all his life. So maybe with my mom, they never told me any stories about any of that. And whenever we had neighbors, they always were very welcoming. You know, we always played with their kids. Paramus was very rural at the time. Paramus was up and coming. So we moved to Paramus in 71. Paramus now is just one big shopping mall and highway. But back then it wasn't like that. There was still a lot of space and people were very welcoming in that type of community and neighborhood. Yeah. You know, in terms of that, I never sensed it. And I never got a sense that they had that kind of animosity in New York either when they were growing up in the 50s. Oh, okay. So let's talk about the German culture a little bit more. You spoke about the orderly part of it and your parents being very grateful for what they had and things like that. Let's talk about some stuff like food and Christmas <laughs> celebration. Christmas is a good one. Christmas yeah. is a great one. Yeah, we could talk about food. I could tell you. <laughs> so Sundays were a very interesting day because you woke up in the morning again as you're a kid, you don't know what time you're waking up. You wake up and you already notice that the kitchen's going. All right, what's mom doing in the kitchen? Well, it seemed like she was boiling vegetables and cabbage forever. Turns out that dinner on a Sunday for the German community happens around one or two o'clock. It's the early bird special for the German community. I remember a lot of coleslaw. I remember a lot of cabbage, smelling a lot of cabbage, a lot of red cabbage. My mom was a very strong proponent on red cabbage. We did a lot of Wiener schnitzel. My father was a butcher, so I have to say, Growing up as a kid, we ate very, very well. I mean, you could make the argument you maybe probably had a little too much meat than you were supposed to, especially these days, knowing this and that. But the meat was always high quality, and my father always cut it for us. That was Sunday afternoon, so you figure, well, 6 o'clock rolls around. What do you guys do for dinner? Well, those were finger sandwiches. So you had this bread that looked like cardboard, which, by the way, I found the exact German bread that my mom used at Jack's right here on Bloomfield Avenue. And I, <laughs> I now buy that bread and I store it in the freezer. I buy like six of them at a time because I'm afraid they're going to run out of them. It's like a pumpernickel bread or it's a rye bread and it's very thin. It's made with sunflower seeds. You know, my mom would make us finger sandwiches and we would be watching TV, you know, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom or something. Marlon Perkins. Marlon Perkins. Marlon yeah, Perkins. Yeah. You know, growing up as a kid, and by the way, we did not have a color TV. Uh, that wasn't until later. But we would have these finger sandwiches, and everything would have butter on it. No matter what sandwich you were eating, it had butter. Liverwurst was a huge, huge thing for us. So can you imagine this? The cardboard bread with uh, basically a stick of butter and liverwurst on top of that. Some sandwiches would be butter with onions, okay? Some sandwiches would be butter with just cheese. That's just what you ate. It's just what you did. And it's like, oh, it's Sunday. Okay, so all right, that's great. Did you have a cardiologist yeah. move in with you too? <laughs> you would think, but I, I tell you, I mean, I love those days. Uh, it sounds delicious, actually. I love liverwurst. Uh, it's great. Karen and I, I always say we have to have a cheat day, you know, once or twice a week. 
We may not eat those type of things, but it's nice to have a cheat day once in a while. I think so. So, Pete, I want to ask you about Christmases. You hear a lot about uh, German (laughs) celebration of Christmas and traditions like that, some of which were brought over to America back in the 19th century. So That's right. Yeah, the idea of the evergreen tree inside a house, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, first of all, we celebrated St. Nicholas Day, which is on December 6th. My mom would leave out these footprints, these cutouts of cotton or whatever, and it would look like little footprints. Mom would say that St. Nicholas was here and they would leave chocolate in your slippers. You'd have to go find your house slippers, which again would be in the same spot they always are, but you would have chocolates in your house slippers. I would ask my friends, you get your chocolate. Friends, what are you talking about? I'm like, what's St. Nicholas Day? Like, no, no, we don't do that. (laughs) (laughs) Christmas was extremely traditional. We celebrated Christmas Eve. That's when you open your gifts. You did not open your gifts on Christmas morning. You open them on Christmas Eve. If you look at old films from the 30s, It's a Wonderful Life, for instance. If you look at that film, look at the type of Christmas tree that they have there. It's not like a full fir tree. It's one of those Charlie Brown looking trees Mm -hmm. with the long branches sticking out of them. My mother would decorate them with tinsel. On St. Nicholas Day is when you set up the tree and you would decorate the tree. And you would finish decorating the tree on Christmas Eve. The thing about that is you didn't decorate the tree with electric lights. You had candle holders that went on this dry tree. And we had candles that you lit during Christmas that had candles all over it. I mean, it was just one accident waiting to happen, especially when I'm diving in looking for my gifts. (laughs) You made sure everything is okay and we're not going to burn down the house and all that kind of stuff. And I remember when we lived in Richfield, my mom would walk us into our room and say, wait here for a second. And and obviously, you know, her and my dad would probably put the gifts under the tree, right? She'd be like, oh, you just missed it. Santa Claus was here. I'm like, what? I missed him again? What? And of course, there's all your presents under there. And it was a great time. And you didn't go over your friend's house because they were opening their gifts because it was Christmas Day. So you had to wait till the afternoon until they got all their gifts. Then you went over their house. That's a great story. And by the way, I'm thoroughly enjoying your very good, (laughs) thorough memory, actually. This is good stuff, Pete. I really appreciate it because this is such an interesting perspective. How have you been impacted by the parents that you had and the heritage that you have? One thing Karen always accuses me of is that she's like, I'm always looking at the the brighter side of things. She's like, you know, you always see the the better part of whatever's going on. COVID is a perfect example. My wife, she has different circumstances with her job. She's like, even during the beginning of this pandemic, you always put a good foot forward. When you go on your Zoom meetings with your math department and stuff, everyone's stressing out. And, you know, you're the guy saying, look, we got to treat time differently. And I really think that my parents' upbringing, again, this was never said. They, they never told me this is what I have to do. They, they led by example. My mom never complained. Father never complained about their situation. And there's something as a kid that you don't really appreciate until as you're getting older and you hear everybody complaining about stuff. And some people have legitimate complaints. And I'm not saying I don't have complaints, but I always feel like there will be a light at the end of a tunnel somehow, somewhere, even though you can't see it up front right away and close. I try to in some way instill that upon my kids. That's not something you can say in, in class. But I kind of lead by example. I try to put a smile on my face. One day we didn't have heat in the school. You know, everyone's complaining. I just had a smile on my face. It's all right. Well, it'll be heat tomorrow. It's all right. We're only in for a half day or whatever. I really believe that is part of who I've become and who I've been for a long period of time without me even realizing it. I always try to look at the outcome as being, it will be more of a positive outcome than a negative outcome. You can't avoid the bumps in the road. But you can deal with the bumps in the road one step at a time, right? That's the way I've always looked at situations. And the other side of it, too, is that I've also been instilled by my parents by, I treat everything that I have precious. I try to really keep things that I have close to me and dear to me, and I, I try not to be wasteful. I can't say I was like that in my 20s, you know, or my, my late 20s, because, you know, you're still kind of figuring things out. But the older I become, the more I appreciate the things and the people in my life that I have. And I hold them very precious and dear to me. And the relationships that I've made, they're very close relationships. I'm lucky because I'm with a person that also feels that way too. Uh, my wife, she's very good with that. You know, she has friends that she she maintains friendship. I can't do that. I have two friends, two very close friends, and I can barely maintain that. But they are my true close friends. And I have a lot of acquaintances too, you being one of them. You know, I find 
those things in my life to be very precious. It's a journey, right? It's a journey. We know how the beginning and the end ends up. It's, it's what happens in between. That's up to us. It's in our control. Things are not in our control, but we can control how we feel about things, right? Can't always control what happens to us, but we can always no. control how we react to it. Yeah. I come from a family, dysfunctional, you know, probably. If you look, you can pick apart any family and call them dysfunctional, sure. you know. They shape themselves and they shape the people around them. And, you know, I hold dear everything that I have, I do to this day. Thank you, Pete. Pete, I really want to thank you for your time and your story. I think it's very important to know where we came from, both the good and the bad, and to be able to use what we learn from our family to make our lives better and other people's lives better. And certainly your positive glass half full attitude is just a refreshing blessing to me and to our listeners. And I really want to thank you again. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Well, I really appreciate it. And thank you for doing what you're doing, because I think your podcast is great. When I listen to your podcast, you get involved in those stories that you've been interviewing. It's just, it is. And I, I totally agree with you. I, I think, you know, I had a conversation with my cousin and uh, I was saying, I want to learn more now. It's inspired me to learn more about my history and, and where I've been and where I'm going. So I, again, I, I really appreciate the opportunity and I want to thank you as well. Thank you again, Pete. All right, you too. Take care, James. Okay. So for all of our listeners, keep discovering and telling stories that inspire you and others. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. Please subscribe, share, and check out our website at yourhistoryyourstory.com for episode notes and bonus content. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.